Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the final week of uh, Moodle MOOC 3. This is Nellie Deutsch, and I'm going to be moderating for Graeme Stanley, who's right there uh, behind my little uh, webcam. Hello, Graeme, and welcome. Welcome to Moodle MOOC 3 and our final week. Uh, I don't think uh, Graeme Stanley needs um, any introduction. People are going to be coming in as we go, and... Um, I'm going to uh, move to your slides. Hello. And where are you today? Uh, if you could add in the chat box where you are. And I believe, Graham, are you in the UK or somewhere in South America? <laughs> Hello, Nelly. At the moment, I'm in the UK, Nelly. Oh, um, but I'm based in Montevideo, in Uruguay. Oh, in Uruguay, great. Uh, let me see. I think it's kind of loud. Are you wearing a headset there? But um, at the moment, I'm in the UK, okay, Nelly. So I guess um, a but I'm based in Montevideo, your, in Uruguay. Uh, device settings on WizIQ and, and lower the volume a bit. Sorry about that. Seems kind of loud, but um, yeah, Much yes, better. I am. We're gonna get started. If you could add in the chat box where you're from, we've got Carol from the United States, Thomas mm -hmm. from Venezuela, um, and people will be coming in as we go. Susan is from Hawaii, and uh, Dr. Abhilash is from India, All right? So, um Perhaps you'd like um, to tell us a bit about what you're doing these days, uh, Graham. Going back and forth from the UK to South America is a bit um, is a bit long. Mm, nice. <laughs> yes yes it is a bit long um i'm actually well i um i'm taking a holiday at the moment so i'm um taking a break from my regular job which is working for the british council excellent um right. on the so plan sabal english that, project I'm sure everybody else is um too, which i will I be mentioning using, uh, as Wiki part spaces. of this presentation which is right. teaching um, so we can get started primary school state school Children in Uruguay, English via video conferencing. Okay, that's great. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, I am going to be talking about um, innovations in language learning spaces, which is something that um, I'm particularly interested in. Okay, that's great. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, I am going to be talking about um, innovations in language learning spaces. This is something that um, I'm particularly interested in, the idea of um, how people are changing the places where they're learning um, languages. And so without further ado, I'll move to the next slide. If you can... I'm sure many of you in the audience uh, recognize this particular image. It's uh, an image of a typical classroom. Um, I think uh, many of us, I certainly uh, grew up uh, and went to a school where we sat in rows at desks very much like this. Um, I think this was taken in the States, but certainly when I went to school in the UK, uh, we were in a similar uh, kind of classroom uh, with a chalkboard and the teacher at the front. At the moment, she's at the back, but uh, certainly a teacher at the front. Um, I think my class was about that many, certainly when I was growing up, this was typical for, for me. Um, so classrooms definitely 
many classrooms used to be like this. Um, now, if you look at a lot of classrooms, you find they're similar in many ways. Um, but, for example, this is a more typical modern day class. Uh, I think you, most of you would agree in the real world, uh, the face to face class uh, room with students again in um, not so much in fixed rows but definitely uh, sitting on chairs in a similar space there's even a blackboard as well and um, the students are definitely less formally dressed than in the last picture uh, so it's more informal but it's still very similar and still rose. Yes, you're right. Um, however, there are also classrooms which a lot of us teach in which are like this. And this is like a lecture theatre, if you like, perhaps more of a higher education uh, context than the other one, which was more of a secondary, with a teacher standing facing the teacher. Um, yes, you're right. I think uh, there's very little room for maneuver in a class like this and even up until a, till a couple of years ago I taught at the university where I was trying to do language classes in a setup like this where I couldn't uh, move the students couldn't move the desks and it was difficult to do pair and group work um, I had to get the students to move and they were very reluctant to do that So I think the main thing I want to talk about today is, um, if anything, what has changed when it comes to language learning spaces? What is changing? What are we in the process of seeing? What changes are we seeing? And how are people learning languages in the 21st century? How are things different now, if they are? I mean, in some cases, it's so, much, so different. But there are uh, differences, which I hope to bring up. And please feel free to write comments, questions in the chat room, and I'll do my best to um, to answer them uh, as we go along. Okay, moving on. In 1993, in his book, The Children's Machine, Seymour Papert, the educationalist, uh, proposed this, which was, uh, if two groups of professionals traveled a uh, hundred years um, from the past into the future and they turned up at their place of work one group being a group of doctors and another a group of teachers the group of doctors would turn up at the hospital they would walk in a hundred years later and they'd be astounded at the changes that had happened in their profession in their place of work they would see many machines which they would not have a clue as to what their function was. They wouldn't really know how to do their job. The instruments, the technology had all changed, has all changed basically. This was in 1993. However, in 1993, if the time traveling teachers turned up at the school, uh, they would walk into the school, go to their classrooms, talk, and start teaching. And I think he made this point uh, to say uh, something about the, the changes or the lack of changes that had happened in education uh, in a hundred years. Uh, teachers were still teaching children in similar ways. And I think this is, this, is, uh, this is true. But I do think what we are seeing nowadays are changes uh, to education, uh, to the places where people learn languages which are starting by interesting and we're surely going to see a lot more uh, in the future as well. So if you look at the classroom today, um, definitely you find that there's more collaborative learning. So there's more working with uh, children in groups, with the teacher in and among the children, not at the front of the classroom, with them uh, doing exploratory learning, etc. This is definitely happening in language learning. Um, when it comes to young learners, you find the actual classroom space is a lot less formal 
than it was in the past. And yes, Abhilash teaches us facilitators. There's a lot more of that. In the Young Learner Classroom, you have uh, classrooms which are very friendly. They are decorated in bright colours. They have spaces, for example, where kids can sit on the floor for storytelling sessions. There are lots of props, puppets, and the tent in this picture, for example. And um, there's a lot more of that going on. So it's a lot less uh, intimidating uh, a space as it, than it was in the past. Then, of course, we come to technology. Technology continues to enter the class. Uh, using their computers by video so it was um, just my end sorry about that um, our speaker stepped out for a second let me uh, stop oh you're back I was going to stop the recording I'm back great sorry about that I hope you can all hear me again. Um, apologize for the intermittent connection. Um, so technology started entering the classroom, and we're seeing more. I'm back. The case. Sorry about that. Context with interactive whiteboard. I hope you can all hear me again. Um, apologize for the intermittent connection. Um, so technology started entering the classroom. And we're seeing more and more this be the case. I used to work in a context with interactive whiteboards. Um, so I had access to the internet and presentation software, etc., which uh, I found um, as I grew accustomed to using it, it was invaluable. And uh, this is me teaching in one of my classes in Barcelona in Spanish. Um, we also see the classroom moving away from schools in some contexts to the home and homeschooling seems to be becoming popular um, in a lot of context i think this is probably an exception to the kind of homeschooling that does occur it does seem to be a very high-tech home with a projector and a big screen with the kids sitting around on laptops and desktops um, but there are cases where I think because of extreme weather conditions, for example, uh, and other reasons, when kids can't get to school, where well, the teacher can uh, uh, get to them across the internet now. And there is does seem to be more of that. I don't know if anyone in the audience has any experience of homeschooling uh, or involved in it, or whether you have any colleagues that do it, but um, I'd love to hear if you do. And then, of course, there's the big problem with larger classes. Uh, in some contexts, for example, China, where there's a lack of teachers, then you do have this particular uh, problem when it comes to uh, teaching a language, English in this case, to very large classes, very large uh, groups group of people. There may not be a, a, a teacher available in the space. It may not be economically viable, etc. And one of the... Um, one of the solutions that uh, some people have come up with, I'm very interested in the kind of solutions to large, teaching large classes um, in this, this kind of context, was proposed by Li Yang in China. And he came up with a, um, a way of teaching which is being called crazy English. Right, go back to the previous slide. You can see that uh, his classroom, if you like, uh, is very, very large. In fact, it's a football stadium. He teaches in very large spaces through a method which requires a lot of repetition. And it's a particular method that has been developed for the Chinese market. Um, there are videos that you can actually see. Uh, here are links to some of them. Um, I'm not going to show them now, though. But what it does is that he actually encourages uh, expression. The Chinese apparently 
um, we're quite shy. And what we need to do is work on the pronunciation a lot and their expression. And so he encourages the students to, he shouts out phrases and he encourages them to repeat uh, the phrases in the crazy English classes. So they all get up on stage and they, um, they basically shout it out and it's repeated, etc. Um, I became quite interested in this and whether or not it was just something which wasn't that popular, but I feel it, it is very popular and uh, it does seem to work for some people in China. And I asked about it within the circles that I, that I moved in, uh, in particular social media, and I got a, a reply from somebody I knew who uh, told me that she lived in China and she was once woken up in the middle of the night with students doing their homework and their homework was to go to a public place which ended up being her street corner and shout out uh, the, um, the homework, the phrases in English together uh, and this was supposed to help. I think it's, it's not something I could probably, I, I think I'd recommend people do but it is something that does seem to be very popular. But for some people, I think it's it shows that you know there is a great desire and motivation to learn uh, English, to learn a language in this way, and people will do it whatever it takes, and so long as the motivation is there, you can make something work in a lot of ways. Not that it's probably the best method. Um, another popular uh, method um, place of learning. Uh, of education that has become quite um, well known recently is the uh, Sugata Mitra um, call in the wall system. He puts an internet and a computer in a wall, and he's done that a lot in India. And a lot of the and let the uh, children get on with it, get on with the learning. He's come under a lot of criticism recently for that, but I think there is um, there is evidence that uh, it has worked in some places over some uh, time, and um, it's certainly worth looking into. It's a, a way of um, learning something without uh, without a teacher, so it's a space. Again, it's a place, a way of um, of language learning through um, minimally invasive education. This idea of letting the children get on with it. Again, um, without a skilled practitioner to guide the children, a lot of people have criticised this and say that um, it's uh, of limited value. But there is some evidence that it has proven to work to some extent. Um, so after Mitra is also behind something called the Granny Cloud, which does involve teachers, if you like, or tutors. It, there are self-organized learning environments, or so solos, and self-organized mediation environments, solos. And um, it came from an idea that he got on a visit to India, where some secondary school Indian children were being introduced by Sugatra so Mitra to Skype, I believe. And he asked the uh, children, if you could do anything with this tool, what would you do? And they said, we would like uh, to um, to have stories read to us in English. And so he sort of thought about this a bit, and he realized that there was a group of the population in the UK, which principally was uh, the retired uh, sector. So... Um, pensioners, for example, people who had stopped working but who were available and so active and uh, and they, he, he tried, he has tried to put them in touch with the other group in India, which are children who don't have a teacher for English, um, and uh, get them to tutor. So he's getting a lot of, uh, it's been nicknamed the granny cloud because most of the uh, volunteers, I believe, are uh, retired teachers, uh, females in general, but not always, and they teach each other and they sing songs in English, uh, they read stories, 
etc. And again, in some circumstances, it has had some uh, some success. I think it's quite an interesting way of 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 a showing of a tool that is being used uh, to bring two groups of people together with time on their hands to in order to enable education. This try and solve the problem of uh, a lack of teachers um, in schools. Uh, so they arrived here. Yeah. Again, it was a solution that was proposed by the Ethiopian government, the education department, to try and solve the problem of uh, a lack of teachers um, in schools. And so their idea was that the teachers that were in the schools were very young and un not very well qualified or experienced, and they wanted to do something about that. So they decided that one way of doing it would be to put plasma TVs in all of the secondary school classrooms and to beam in teachers via satellite to teach the classes. The idea was to um, follow this up with some group work uh, by the local classroom assistant, if you like, or classroom teacher, depending on the context. And again, this is something I first heard about at the IATEFL conference some years ago, and it was um, in a symposium, I think, about uh, Lord, teaching large classes English and this was brought up and the, the teacher's experience of this was not very good it wasn't something that he thought was working uh, I actually contacted a friend of mine who had traveled to Ethiopia and asked her about this and she said uh, that the, her only experience of it um, was that uh, she went to a secondary school class and she was shown a cupboard where there was a boxed uh, plasma TV. And uh, the problem is that the head teacher said that they didn't have uh, electricity to be able to use the uh, TV. So I think it's an example of sending technology to a large extent, sending technology to schools without really thinking about uh, whether the rest of the, in those schools or whether the training, etc. Is adequate to cope with it. Having said that, however, and I think yes, the, there are lots of problems uh, involved with this, managing attention, etc. Having said that, I did find a, a thread on Facebook that was started with um, by some ex-students who'd uh, been exposed to this kind of teaching, and there were some very positive uh, comments about it, which surprised me. Uh, for instance, you probably might not be able to read some of these comments, but um, Merkebu Amrach said, I was excited and furious. First it was new to me, and then and we were anxious. And then when the class began, the teacher talked too fast, etc., but then I adopted the program and became easier. And then others uh, mentioned that it was really enjoyable, etc. Um, so it certainly worked for some students. I think one of the things that happened was um, the plasma teaching that was being done by satellite from South Africa was then switched to recordings. They had the idea of making recordings of the teacher, and that was used. Um, I don't think, it, as far as I'm aware, I don't think it's going on at the moment. I think ultimately it wasn't felt to have been a success. And uh, it sounds like some from the, your chat it seems like some of you have some experience of this kind of teaching, which would be interesting to share later if you want. Um, this brings me on to another solution which I'm personally involved in. Um, rather than plasma teaching, what we're doing in Uruguay is uh, video conferencing. Um, there's a lack of um, children, sorry, a lack of qualified English teachers in most primary schools across the country. And you may know that Plan Sabal is um, a Uruguayan initiative that has put uh, uh, a laptop, one of these EXO laptops, in the hands of every secondary and primary school 
state school child in the country in Uruguay. And I think it's the only country that's managed to do it, across the country at least. They're able to do that, of course, because it's a very small country, a population of just over 3 million people. So um, that makes it easier, of course. There is also free internet in across the country in the schools, and the internet is now being replaced by uh, fiber optic connections. And they have put in most schools video conferencing equipment, high quality video conferencing equipment. And this is sponsored via government initiatives and grants, etc. And what that uh, means is that the um, able to roll out a program from 2012, which the pilot was and last year, um, we reached uh, just over just under 1,000 classes a week being taught uh, uh, English classes a week in the Uruguayan schools um, across the country from Montevideo, Mexico, Colombia, and the Philippines by remote teachers who coordinate with the classroom teachers. So it's a kind of um, team teaching, if you like. The classroom teachers in the classrooms in Uruguay, they're qualified primary teachers, but just not language teachers. And they handle the classroom management, the group work. They make sure that everything is working, etc. And they also do follow-up practice activities during the week. Sibal Abhilash is the name of the organization. It's also the... Um, the um, a name of a tree in Uruguay, um, but it's Plan Sabal is an organisation uh, that was set up to to do this kind of education in the country, and the teaching that's going on, and we're just about to expand to two thousand classes a week. Um, we've learned quite a lot about what it takes. It, unlike the plasma teaching in in Ethiopia. It's communicative teaching, it's direct. The remote teacher tries his or her best to establish a real connection with the children, to know their names, to call upon them, to, uh, to teach them to have interaction going on, to do games and songs as you would, as far as possible, you would in a normal um, young learner classroom, but uh, from a distance. and. Um, this expansion, it's going to be moving to 2,000 classes a week in March and April, and then next year, it's, which will be about 4,500, perhaps more, in the rest of the country next year. And it's it's a, quite an exciting project. I'm very uh, honoured and proud to be part of it um, as the project manager, helping uh, this happen. And uh, we're trying to document it as far as possible to be able to learn from it, to be able to see if, uh, uh, to, to make changes, to improve it, and see if it can be um, adapted to other educational circumstances as well, which I think um, if, as we believe it, it will be um, successful, then I think there are a number of different places where um, it could be done. That's right, Kalyan. <laughs> That's uh, definitely the case. It was an acronym based on the uh, um, based on the word Sabal, the name of the tree, but it does actually stand for uh, something else as well. Then, if we move away from classrooms, which is where where language learning is becoming very common to see people involved in is definitely the online spaces. And we have things such as, uh, again, British Council, and there are lots of websites. The British Council websites are very, very popular. And they're um, places, examples of places that can be bought real face-to-face -face classes or even online courses. We use uh, the Learning English Kids website, for example, in, in Plan Saval. Um, we're also, you can also find parents in them, uh, these uh, websites with their children um, to help them learn as well. Um, songs, games, etc. And uh, it certainly can add to a language course, although it's not actually, uh, strictly speaking, can't be used on its own. However, there are other, there are definitely other 
spaces that um, that can be used independently and people are using them. One of the most popular ones at the moment is Duolingo. I don't know if anyone in the chat room has tried that out. Um, it's quite an interesting crowdsourced, I believe, uh, gamified language learning um, program. It's very fun, very much fun. I tried it, uh, even though I speak Spanish, I tried it with the Spanish. And there's a lot of translation going on between English and Spanish. Spanish and Spanish and English have a lot of odd translation. So there were some that uh, I definitely noticed, which um, was is a little bit unfortunate when it comes to learning a language because if you learn something, it's very difficult to unlearn it. And there are other websites like this, like Live Mocker um, and Busu, etc. Other websites. Um, exist. The BBC, for example, has uh, a number of different video-based courses. Um, Mi Vida Loca is a really interesting uh, sort of interactive video course uh, for Spanish for beginners. It was it was actually developed quite some time ago, still there and uh, worthwhile uh, having a look at. And there are people who use these spaces definitely to learn languages. When it comes to um, self-autonomous, uh, if you like, uh, language learning. And there's a lot of people who um, are now uh, setting up their own um, personal language learning spaces. This comes, of course, I'm sure, um, as a reaction to the kind of institutionalized um, language learning um, systems that a lot of blended learning courses uh, take. So courses that have parts uh, face to face and online um, usually have as their component a learning management system or virtual learning environment like Moodle. And um, the thing about these types of courses that um, uh, a lot of people have found is that they're normally organized, not always, but organized through an institution. And when you leave that institution, you leave the learning, uh, the connections, etc., that you've created. Uh, during the course um, behind you. And so the reaction to that has been this idea of having each of the students having their own sort of PLE, personal learning environment, which a combination of free tools, if you like, including uh, recently certainly um, the social networks such as Twitter and Facebook, um, usually involving a blog for reflection, and uh, people get together with other people which is the PLM aspect of it, the personal learning network, to be able to create connections and learn together. What you're all doing at the moment, of course, through a MOOC, but certainly um, you'll probably, uh, you all probably consider that you have a group of people that you learn from and that you help learn as well. Um, PLNs was something that I got involved in a few years ago with the European Union project and I I can definitely recommend you can have a look at that, um, especially if you're an organization that uh, would like to promote uh, this type of language learning or learning, in fact. Um, there's a lot there that we produced uh, during the project that you may find of interest, um, guides for mentors, etc., ways of doing it. And also a lot of people connected and still using the, um, the, the site um, who uh, certainly are worthwhile connecting to uh, language teachers and learners, not only in Europe, but around different parts. Um, support this, of course. There are lots of different tools of all shapes and sizes. Um, social media is one of the best ways, I think. Um, you probably all agree with me when I say that, connecting to people and learning through Facebook groups um, is a fantastic thing. Other websites, Twitter, although it's become less popular, is certainly uh, still well worth um, using to connect to people and to help learn languages. There are other spaces. You're together in a MOOC, um, which I think more and more MOOCs seem to be uh, very popular places where people are getting together. And there are some language learning MOOCs 
which I haven't tried them. I don't know if anyone here ha have tried them, but there are some for learning Spanish, there are some for learning English, and I think we'll be seeing a lot more of these uh, in the future as well, as people turn to them of learning a language. I was very involved in, um, in virtual worlds, especially when, um, when they first something like Second Life, which seems to have declined in popularity, became very um, popular. And one of the things that I found um, using Second Life um, is that this seemed to be a very uh, immersive way of learning a language. Um, it, there were times when I was uh, using these virtual worlds and very much felt uh, um, quite it, the experience of, of actually teaching and learning in them felt very much like a, an experience almost comparable to being in a 3D space. I think um, the, it, it did feel very memorable. Um, you could remember a lot more than perhaps if you would do in a virtual classroom um, environment. Uh, where usually the format is quite similar and you have the slides change and you may have webcams of people in the chat room. But in Second Life, you could do all sorts of things in 3D, bring all sorts of things into it. Ultimately, I think, for me at least, Second Life became a place where uh, rather than get easier to do things, things got harder. It required, they required more um, hardware uh, requirements, uh, etc. I do think that uh, it still will be uh, interesting and people will, will go back to it. But I think things do need to change and things need to get better for it to become uh, truly uh, popular again. And perhaps it won't be Second Life, but another virtual world. But having said that, there are lots of people who are active in Second Life in the language teaching and learning community. Um, the ELT community is still quite active. Not as active as it was a couple of years ago, but there are people who get together. Uh, they learn languages. In fact, the other day, I talked to someone who um, still learns Italian. A friend of mine still learns Italian in Second Life, and she teaches French there. And so there are groups of people who uh, use these spaces for language learning and teaching. And uh, although they are in a minor minority, they get enormous pleasure out of doing it, and find, some of them find it very, very useful. And it certainly works uh, for some people. Um, and as I said, there seems to be quite a lot of research going on at the university level into this kind of learning as well. There are projects which are quite um, popular when it comes to a lot of um, the core computer-aided assisted language learning conferences, you still see a lot of people search into the effectiveness of using virtual worlds for language learning and teaching. And I think we'll definitely, this will continue and we'll see more of that in the future. Another place where I find there's a lot of informal language learning going on are uh, online games. I certainly was at a conference where I spoke about um, learning uh, languages teaching with games and I one of the while we were setting up um, this was about five years ago while we were setting up one of the uh, students at the university where the place the conference was being held uh, came up to us and was particularly interested in what we were saying and she, he said that yes he would basically learned most of his English through playing World of Warcraft informally and uh, I thought this was fascinating. Um, I've explored World of Warcraft and it does seem to be of limited value from a, in a formal context for learning languages but I think there's so much going on there um, that you can uh, you can apply to language learning not just English because there are different languages that you can play this game in um, Spanish, German, Italian etc. Um, that you can um, you can definitely use it um, and learn languages there, and some people are definitely doing that. Not only World of Warcraft, of course, this is just the most popular of the massively multiplayer online games, or uh, MOGs, 
that exist. In fact, my uh, interest in in games and language learning um, um, led me to start a blog up with a colleague of mine and, and to publish a book called Digital Play. Uh, you can see the book on the right and the blog on the left, which we still um, do uh, continue to post to. And I think um, we we kind of found that uh, the spaces that were of most interest to us, or at least to um, our uh, that was something that um, I'm still interested in, and it seems to have become more popular. Uh, you find more and more people using uh, digital games in the classroom to the classroom use. Um, and I think um, that was something that uh, I'm still interested in, and it seems to have become more popular. Uh, you find more and more people using uh, digital games in the classroom, etc. Finally, I'll move on to uh, mobile learning. I think this is another interesting kind of space that people more and more are doing things with. As mobile has become more um, more popular, there's more language learning and, uh, and even teaching going on using mobile devices. So many now different apps um, that people can download and use on their way to work, on their way to school, or you know, even while watching TV, or doing anything really um, to learn a bit of a language. They range from uh, things like games, uh, which are, are a bit like sort of tests of grammar or vocabulary, to podcasting, of course, which is uh, ideal for mobile um, devices, uh, where you can listen to lots of, uh, for example, programs or either professionally produced or, or amateur, but produced by amateurs in their bedrooms. Um, there's so many of them around. Um, to perhaps other things which involve video or um, even a, a kind of um, different kind of app such as the British Council My Wordbook app which allows you to create your own vocabulary work, workbook which I think is quite an interesting innovation. Um, certainly a lot of people have found that useful. Frogs? I don't think I can hear any frogs now. <laughs> At least I hope there aren't any frogs in my uh, my house yet. <laughs> okay, I've finished a little bit earlier um, because I'm definitely interested in perhaps opening things up. And uh, I know I've seen lots of comments from a lot of people uh, in the chat room. I would love to hear from people what kind of spaces you think are interesting these days for learning and teaching languages, what, whether you would like to um, share those in the chat room or whether it's possible, if possible, Nelly, if someone can take the microphone and talk so about much, it. Graeme. Again, yes, you could um, ask a question please, to me, uh, we could uh, share your experience, like etc. I mean, I'd quite like to open up the floor to, and uh, find out your questions from in the chat. Sorry you, about the frogs. Uh, it, more um, about your own context. It must have been the mic or something. I don't know why I thought of frogs. Um, maybe because I haven't seen a frog for a long time. There's a question there. What about your context? Yeah, there's a question there by Cal Yen. Do you think teachers should develop their own framework of mobile learning before they use them with learners? Cal Yen, would you like the mic? While we're waiting for volunteers, Nelly, what about your context? I can pass on the mic. It's a lot better to hear. And that's interesting. I heard it again. Interesting. Kalyan doesn't have a mic. Ah, oh, it doesn't. Yeah, I think um, I think teachers should definitely. I'm all for teachers trying out things before they ask their learners to try them out. But so I think, yeah. Kalyan yeah. um, doesn't have a mic. Yeah, I think um, I think teachers should definitely. I'm all for teachers trying out things before they ask their learners to try them out. 
So yes, is the short answer. But I think the interesting thing about mobile devices is, well, is uh, I mean, yeah, rather than I inside the classroom, mobile. although, you know, in a context I'm not, I'm not where to let them, but I children or, or adults uh, can be their devices can. to and the classroom love, and you, know, getting information uh, I ask you can find I ways of working with them. I think well, that's I useful as well. What about you, Nelly? Um, so I think that mobile is a great way to get students to uh, get immediate, um, you know, information instant information which is what they like and then um they sustain learning a lot better that way if they get what they're asking for or what they need um let's see any susan says she needs a mobile device to practice with yeah a lot of teachers are a bit behind when it comes to mobile devices they're not behind when it comes to the internet but they are a bit behind when it comes to um, Androids and I guess iPhones. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree. I think a lot of the time, I think the teachers have been, um, well, I think in schools and, and other education organizations, you feel a bit left behind, I think, often. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I, I agree. I think a lot of the time, I think the teachers have been, um, well, I think in schools and, and other education organizations, we feel a bit left behind, I think, often. The only difference um, is the thumbs. You know, if you get, if but, you uh, see someone I think with their, it's you know, just to sort of dive in and use it. Many people now are using mobile devices in their personal lives. It's the idea is. Or with the it's become easier to, you know, to use them in an education theory. context as well because so of that. It's a pretty young, I, I would say, a young uh, people's learning device. It certainly is a learning device. Yeah, I agree with you. I tend to use my index finger. <laughs> <laughs> Try it. You know, it's amazing. Try both. You know, you know, you make mistakes sometimes. You hit the wrong key. You, you what? You don't have two thumbs? What do you mean? No, I have big thumbs. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with you. I, I tend to use my index you finger. Think so? Unfortunately. <laughs> <Try>. <laughs> um, any comments? I have big thumbs, though, Nelly. No, I'm talking about adult kids. You know, the age of 30, you're pretty much. No, I have uh, big thumbs. You're an adult. You're not going to grow anymore. It's clumsy for me oh, using thumbs are, <laughs> my thumbs for <laughs> typing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'd like uh, people to voice kids, their kids questions thumbs are and comments. Uh, don't be shy. Uh, raise your hand or give me a thumbs up if I can pass on the mic to you. There was some question about training for the best English. I'm not quite sure about that question. Perhaps whether mentioned you could take the microphone and elaborate on um that's probably abhilash sure. yeah Ab abhilash usually has uh audio there was some okay. question so about abhilash, training for the best the english i'm not quite sure Can about that question perhaps by, uh, whether teacher, mentioned you could take the microphone and elaborate on that poorly behaved teachers not quite sure what that was about Okay, there we go. Hello, Dr. Abhilash. We hear you. Hello. Yeah. Um, we'd like clarification. Yeah. Can you clarify what you mean? Hello. Hello. About Hello, Dr. or bad. Bad English I teachers, what training do you recommend for the best I English? Or other? Susan, the conversation you had with Susan Dixon in the chat. Uh, about what? Right, right. Mobile learning? Right, right. 
uh, actually what happens uh, in india there is a great demand for english teachers in uh, in the government schools that unfortunately because the government schools pay very low to the teachers so good good people they don't prefer to go for these government schools and the people who don't find any other source of employment they get into these schools as a result of this the students suffer i have i have seen i when i was uh, working in uh, regional institute of english chandigarh i came in contact with a couple of teachers from the rural areas who were teaching convent school okay thank you for elaborating i think you're right i think they they just so we, we need to provide good trainers who can train these teachers so that they can be models for their student, students that's what i meant by that okay thank you for elaborating i think you're right i think there there does need to be um there needs to be an opportunity for the teachers to improve um their own language skills uh, if that is required definitely but also for them to receive enough training to be able to use for example if uh, what we were talking about mobile devices etc i think um these for teachers to to learn more um has never been better uh so long as you have access to the internet i think there are so many places and uh, different spaces now that where you can go to to improve upon um it's quite phenomenal i think the, the, the trick is to find one that works for you and um and that works uh, you know that and to find the time to be able to do it is and is often a problem as well and and the homes that they come from but it seems that money um brings money and it's all about money because if you're poor and you live in poor areas you know i don't know about uruguay but i presume it's the same in uruguay that i mean i know it was like that in uh when i was in um par in paraguay um close to uruguay i i was shocked to see kids on the streets they don't go to school they they beg for food because they just don't happen to be in the right economic situation their parents are poor so they don't go to school um and they don't get anything and it's horrifying to think that because of poverty and the government's i guess can't afford to do anything else uh that you don't get education yeah so no, of course it's um it's very sad i know there are some schools that have visited in you why where the kids um really only eat when they go to school uh, in some context so uh, they yeah they no of course it's um it's very sad i know there are some schools that i visited in uruguay where the kids um really only eat when they go to school uh, in some contexts so uh, uh, they come in on the monday and they're hungry because they haven't had a decent meal all weekend uh, they provide in from primary schools they're provided with um with food uh there and uh, there are lots of i mean there are lots of uh, social situations where education is just part of the problem but um i think um it's certainly one of the solutions to a better standard of life for many people and so uh where it can take place uh, if it can take place in more different places and access to english language teaching or language teaching or other aspects of education where it can be given i think um, we should do some face to face moocs the better in some of these under privileged countries that it wouldn't be online it would be mock massive open courses mock yes susan i'm i'm considering it at university level as well or higher education level um i wonder how how popular how successful a mooc aimed at lower age group would be yeah i think a lot of the the mooc seem to be 
at university level as well or higher education level um, I wonder how how popular how successful a MOOC aimed at lower age groups would be yeah that's a good point there by Cal Yen that uh, one way of getting around all this but again it's a problem with um, internet connectivity even though with mobiles you can get for example with IQ or other uh, apps uh, to work I mean you can get YouTube apps um, and other things on mobile on cell phones so that uh, maybe that way you know it's a lot cheaper maybe to get kids to use cell phones but you still need you know an internet connection how do you get around it so as long as uh, the internet uh, may be free but it actually requires an infrastructure that's quite expensive As, as Tom says, MOOC, a MOOC sort of depends on dedication and autonomous learning, and younger children may not be dedicated enough to that. In, in the context of MOOC, yeah, as, as Tom says, MOOC, a MOOC sort of depends on dedication and autonomous learning and younger children may not be dedicated enough to that in, in the context in Uruguay Kalyan has a question I see about distinguishing why that's why it only really works to require two two classroom teachers if you like but um it certainly seems to work and Kalyan has a question I see about distinguishing between formal and informal learning spaces. I think the formal learning spaces as well, they, they tend to be um, the, uh, the ones where people sign up for. Uh, so with language learning, it's, you know, they happen at state schools, private schools, um, institutes, academies, etc. And I think, you know, signing up for a, a MOOC um, is kind of a formal um, commitment as well. Certainly, if you take it seriously and you do the, uh, follow the course, you go to all the, you attend or go uh, watch all of the videos, etc., and you do the tests, etc., then that's certainly a formal way of learning. But I think the interesting thing about MOOC, a lot, lot of the MOOCs that I've gone through, I've done informally, so I've done the tests. I haven't done all of the course, but I've dipped in and out, in and out when I've had time. And I, I think it's unfortunate that MOOC have, had a, have received a sort of reputation based on only the formal learning that people are doing there. And a lot of people have rushed to sort of say that they don't work because only a certain small percent of people actually finish and get the certificate. But certainly I feel that gained enormously from the MOOCs that I've done and I haven't uh, really taken any tests, uh, which is a shame. Next step, whatever that step is, and bring you closer to something else. It uh, doesn't necessarily have to be... Uh, tested through tests. So until we get rid of tests, which is going to take a long time, um, you know, there are problems with um, with learning in general. Well, I think uh, we've reached our... Yeah, go ahead. For me is the amount of choice available now. No, that's all just the amount of choice available now. Um, uh, hopefully, more people will have more choices. Um. Yeah, I think the great thing is great, the you know, for me is the amount of choice available and, now. And I know what the situation is like in Paraguay. And no, that's all. Just the amount of so, choice available now. Um, but, um, would you think uh, about getting hopefully teachers from more the people world will have world more choices um, um, into the schools to bring them? you know, periodically to have teachers from around the globe pitch in and help out? Yeah, our, uh, in our thing, it's kind of complicated in a little way because we require the, 
the teachers to have access to high-end video conferencing uh, for it to go ahead. There are lots of reasons why that's the case. The video conferencing... Yeah, our, uh, in Uruguay, our thing is kind of complicated in a little way because we require the the teachers to have access to high-end video conferencing uh, for it to go ahead. There are lots of reasons why that's the case. The video conferencing equipment is now in the schools. I was thinking of some um, the quality and reliability of the connection and the classes you can guarantee with uh, fiber optic cable and high-end video conferencing units, etc. And they're able to do it. All right. Lots to think about. Um, I'm sure everybody's thinking of uh, themselves and what they can contribute and how they can move this forward at the moment I'd how like thank you um, successful they would for certainly they're and cheaper for contributing and uh, worth exploring your information and what you're doing always interesting i wish you all the best as i'm sure everybody does there in the chat box and wherever they happen to be all the best with a project i know it's going to work just the fact that you're there is an indication that it's working uh, so all the best if you could join us later on i know you're on holidays uh, but there is a link that Thank tom you. hodgers added it's a place where we can continue the discussions so you're invited to join and um, continue perhaps share some of the links so thank you thank you so much everybody for joining us uh, there's going to be another session later on in a couple of hours i think in about three hours so thank you thank you so much thank you and thank you for inviting me nelly thank you okay for coming. i've enjoyed it thank you thank you for being here bye 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 bye, bye everyone